not to be confused with Endgame. Um, so, um, as usual, um, please mute unless you're planning on speaking, uh, just to keep the audio clear. Um, thank you for being on time. And note that this uh, is being uh, recorded and the video will be made available to watch later. So I'm Dave Hunt, uh, Engineering Manager for the Firefox Performance Testing Team. These gatherings started as a way for me to keep up with the latest projects and practices, the formats and monthly gathering with the guests uh, to talk about a project they're working on and passion with that. Hey, Toronto, Hello. could you please mute? Um, so, uh, please join the Automation News channel on my LC or Slack, as these can be used for sharing resources uh, or ask, uh, you can ask questions. Um, I will monitor those channels. Uh, so, I try to schedule these uh, every month. The times and dates vary depending on the guests' availability. Next month, uh, we'll have two external guests, Brendan Alexander and John Jansen, who are joining us from Microsoft to provide a brief uh, history and overview of their web hint tool. Uh, if you're interested in being a guest in the future gathering, or if you have any feedback or suggestions for guests, please drop me an email. Uh, as usual, we may not use up the full hour, um, and there should be some time for questions towards the end. So, uh, if you've just joined us, I'd like to remind you to please mute and note once more that this event is being recorded. So, our guest today uh, is Ali Sullivan. Uh, Ali uh, responded to a tweet I made last November when I announced my new role at, at Mozilla as the manager of the performance test engineering team, and I was asking for book recommendations. Uh, Ali replied to share that she was just moving on from a very similar position in Google, working on Chrome and offered her own recommendations. So Annie currently uh, works for Google, working on web platform metrics, and she's about to embark on a tour of duty at the US Digital Service. She lives in Ann Arbor in Michigan and is trained in a number of martial arts. She's Annie Sully on, on Twitter and blogs at AnnieSully.com. So everybody, please welcome Annie Sullivan. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to talk to you and also learn more about how you do performance testing at Mozilla. Uh, so I guess we can just flip to the next slide. I'm so sorry I couldn't get the slides to come up at the same time as the live stream, so I have to make, make Dave uh, flip the slides. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I led performance testing on Google Chrome for about four years, uh, and I contributed a lot to performance testing and performance in Chrome uh, before that. Sorry about that, my screen just went out. Um, uh, and then before that, I worked on uh, a lot of uh, other apps at Google, and I did a lot of WebPerf there. Uh, so what I wanted to start off with, oh, sorry, you can go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> uh, so what I want to start off with is like how we even define performance, because I, I think it, it traditionally and correctly, most people think about uh, speed, uh, fast frame rates, uh, fast page loads, and those things are all really important. Uh, memory usage and uh, battery and binary size aren't, aren't really performance technically, but we have uh, we do performance testing using the exact same frameworks for for uh, all those types of resource usages as we do for performance uh, for a couple reasons. One is that they they work really well. You want to like show a graph over time and alert when it's it's uh, changed, and also you want to be able to kind of have everything in the same system. So maybe you regress memory, but you improve speed or vice versa, and you want to be able to see that all in the same place. So that, that's why we, we have this kind of broad definition of the word performance for performance testing. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then uh, one thing that kept coming up over and over again when we would talk to developers who were just starting to like work on performance testing for their area is that Oh, my team really focused very, very deeply on regressions. Uh, Chrome, I think, is the same as every other modern browser. It's They're very, very optimized already. You, you can uh, spend engineering years trying to make page load or some other user-facing metric just like 1% faster. Uh, but what you can do really easily and very accidentally is make it 1% slower. So uh, we, we think it's a lot of bang for the buck to, to invest in regression testing and be able to narrow down to a specific commit uh, that, so that we can uh, address regressions really quickly. So, so our lab testing is very, very focused on regressions. 
uh, but we ended up having a lot of um, confusion when we would talk to people because when people are just thinking about performance testing, uh, I think they, they take a very good approach, right? They, they want to have things on automated builds and they want to be able to, to run their, their tests. And, uh, you know, it, it's always a best practice in software to run automated tests. But I think that, that uh, we tend to have a lot of this conversation with developers a lot where we say, like, first, you know, it can be really, really hard to get the metric right just locally work really hard on making sure that you have a metric that you understand. And then um, tools like web page tests, we use an internal tool called cluster telemetry, a tool that can run the met like run the metric on like a thousand sites. And then you can look at the outliers, like uh, understanding what your performance is locally and doing like local measurements is super, super important compared to like, if you don't really understand what you're measuring and you get it on an automated build, you're going to be very sad. Uh, so, we, we have this conversation a lot and it's something to always think about when you're talking to developers about their, their needs with performance testing. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out is that it's very, very hard to predict a performance improvement. Like if, if we had a regression already and then we could take that test case and put it in the lab, that's awesome. We, we know that that's probably gonna be a real regression, but it's uh, the opposite isn't always true. Like if you have some, like, like they're, they're, in the ideal world, you could have some performance tests and it's repeatable and you run it locally and you get a 1% improvement on page load and then all the pages load 1% faster, but that's not how the internet works. It's too complicated. Uh, so we, we would prefer to like um, look at end user data to see how much uh, your change actually improved things. Uh, so we do a lot of A-B testing at Google. Uh, it's not always applicable, right? Like uh, for example, when you're working on a new feature, when, when we first had the idea to do service workers, we couldn't tell them to test it in the wild because no sites use service workers. So there, there's cases where they have to do um, lab testing, but but uh, I think thinking really carefully about like what what the goals are, uh, short term and long term, and how you're going to get there is really important. Uh, so next slide. All right. Uh, speaking of goals, performance testing has some very different competing goals. Uh, so I kind of, I wrote three of the big ones that, that we talk about a lot. Um, so I'm going to go through them one by one. So next slide is reproducibility. Uh, if you're doing, oops, sorry, uh, lab testing, and, and you basically you have a continuous build and it runs a performance test, reproducibility is just absolutely critical. If you can't tell whether something is just noise or whether it was actually performance regression, developers are not going to find it useful. Uh, you also have to be able to reproduce well enough to run over and over again and narrow down to a specific commit. Ideally, uh, it reproduces uh, it locally as well, so the developer can see, okay, before my change, it looked like this. After my change, it looked like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, realism. So this is a slide from a V8 Teams talk at Blink on 6. Uh, it's to talk, I talk about um, very it's how they're optimizing JavaScript and how they changed over time. Uh, so these graphs are basically showing you uh, the distribution of time spent in various benchmarks. At the top is the Octane benchmark, and this is kind of their argument for turning down the Octane benchmark. Then the speedometer benchmark, and then on the bottom are 25 like very popular pages. So they basically did the same like system breakdown in a benchmark that we designed several years ago. And then in real web pages, and what you, you find is that the breakdown is very different. So if you only look at Octane, if you think you can, you know, make make that uh, green bar a little percent bigger by, and and make the um, pink bar much smaller, it sounds like a good idea, but that might not be a good idea in real life. Uh, real life is like really complicated. There's you know billions and billions of web pages. There's lots of different types of devices. Uh, Devices aren't always getting better too. In emerging markets, we're trying to run on lower and lower end devices. There's different network connections. There's a lot that goes into um, into real life. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about it's very hard to, to write a test. So you optimize a test and then you're like, okay, it's, it's that good in the real world too. Uh, but realism is really directly opposed to reproducibility, right? Like um, we've had people ask like, oh, can I some antivirus software on your Windows bots because that like really messes up performance and it does and it's more realistic that somebody would have antivirus software but we're not going to be able to re reproduce performance regressions if there's like you know every 10 minutes the antivirus does a check or something like that so so realism is important but it's also kind of a competing goal to to reproducibility uh, and then the next slide I talked about like some aspects of, of realism 
if you want to go to the next slide, uh, like, like the whole world is changing all the time. Uh, so, so Octane actually was quite a realistic benchmark when it came out, but every year web content gets different. Like things like the, the Facebook like button changing could change vast majority of, it could change performance all over the web. Like it changes all the time. Uh, you know, new frameworks coming out, React can change the, the different aspects of performance on the web uh, for better or for worse. And uh, new devices coming out, they might not be better than old devices. That's, that's not really true anymore. So uh, we have to kind of keep up with uh, reality changing, which makes it really hard to track performance over time. Uh, next slide. A third uh, big competing goal we have is understandability. So being able, like sometimes I said, it's very, very hard to actually write a good performance metric. It's even harder to make one that's very understandable. Uh, so we took the trade off, for example, for first contentful pane, it's very clearly defined, like the first text image or SVG element that dis uh, you know, displays on the page. Uh, but that's uh, actually pretty bad for reproducibility if you have performance tests, like at least in Chrome, like little squiggles in the layout engine can cause big jumps in the metrics. So making it understandable can be competing with making it reproducible or making it more realistic. I think you can come up with reasons why FCP isn't like solely the most realistic page metric, for example, as well. Um, another big thing for understandability is just being able to get diagnostic information from your benchmarks, like what's going on, how does this break down, where did this happen, where's the slowdown, that type of stuff. And uh, being able to make sure that developers have tools for local debugging so they can like repeat, 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 figure out what's going on. Uh, next slide. So with all that in mind, I'm actually gonna talk about our performance testing framework now. <laughs> and uh, we have like kind of a stack is, is how we see it. Uh, we have like the actual hardware that we test on in, in the lab and the operating systems and things like that, like all the system administration type stuff. Then we have a test framework. On top of the test framework, we've written benchmarks. Uh, on top of the benchmarks, they run in a continuous build on the hardware and then they send the data to a dashboard and the dashboard automatically detects regressions. Uh, we can't quite run fast enough for um, every commit because there's hundreds of commits to Chromium a day to, to have its own testing. So we uh, bisect between uh, revisions. Uh, so first I'll talk about uh, the bottom of the hardware. Next slide. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of break that back down into these competing goals and, and say what we do to, to address them if we do anything. Uh, so for realism, we are really big sticklers about testing on real devices. We have Android devices in the lab. We have Windows laptops, Mac laptops, Chrome OS laptops, and uh, Linux boxes. And uh, we have to buy a whole lot of hardware to do this, but especially with uh, especially with um, you know how, how things have moved to the GPU and things like that, it, we find it just very, very difficult to be sure that we can simulate things correctly. Uh, we also uh, try to tra test as close to production builds as possible, so we use release official builds. Uh, those are kind of the big things we do for realism. Next slide. Uh, reproducibility. So uh, it's actually really hard to reproduce things on real hardware. Uh, for example, you can buy a, a block of devices, uh, the exact same device, the exact same OS, everything's configured the same. And they'll give you like slightly different scores on all, most of your performance metrics. So we actually uh, tie each test every time it runs in the continuous build, it goes to the exact same device. Uh, that helps a lot with reproducibility. It's not enough to make sure the device changes don't uh, cause problems. So we have this thing called a reference build. Every time we run a performance test on tip of tree, we also run on uh, Chrome stable on the same device. And then we send that data point up to the perf dashboard and it, it shows them both so that you can say like, oh, they both jump. There might be something weird about the device and not weird about performance. Uh, as much as possible, we turn everything running on the background, like, like, okay, Google on the device, we turn all that stuff off. On Android especially, uh, heat can be a big concern. We have a lot of, of work in the lab on cooling. Uh, this is just for stability reasons, but we also wait for the device to cool down between runs. And uh, we also throttle the CPU, which is a big reproducibility realism trade-off. Next slide. 
And like I said, we don't do anything for understandability about hardware. Like it would be really awesome if you could just, you know, run the emulator of the device that that uh, that fit, that um, regress. But we can't do things like that. So we have like the realism understandability trade off. Our test framework, I know this is super confusing. It was named before everybody named their like real world metrics telemetry. So our test framework, it's a it's an automated benchmark framework and it's called telemetry. And I'm sorry, that's confusing. Uh, I have a pointer to the source code there. Uh, it's cross platform. It supports like all of the different operating systems and devices that Chrome runs on. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, one of the key uh, concept in telemetry is that it breaks apart a benchmark into two parts. Uh, it has metrics, which are like how how you actually measure performance. So like first contentful paint is a metric, right? And you can imagine getting first contentful paint on a thousand different web pages. Those web pages would be the test cases or the stories, and the the metric is like the performance measurement that you're doing. And I, ideally, and almost always, they're independent of like what the test case is. And uh, we, we have a pretty uh, deep support for test cases. Uh, we record real web pages and we can support user input and multi-page navigations and even like app switching on Android, which can be a, a performance concern. Uh, but what we try to do in, in general is have as few metrics as possible and then be able to support lots and lots and lots of test cases, uh, partly because it's just very confusing for developers to have lots of metrics. And also metric quality is really difficult. It's, it's really hard to design a good metric. So we try to focus on having fewer good ones as opposed to lots of them, and, and then just having more test cases. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how do we make telemetry as, as realistic as possible? So we have, uh, a framework called WPR Go, and it records and replays uh, real web pages. And we uh, we actually do have thousands of, of recorded web pages in the test framework. It can simulate net network conditions so that we can use slower networks or uh, faster networks. And like I said, it could do user input, multi-page navigation, so uh, we we can get as realistic as possible. Uh, next slide. reproducibility. So we really work hard also to provide a deterministic environment. Uh, the browser profile, the cache, everything like that is going to be exactly the same on HRUN. We replay recorded websites instead of using live sites, especially ads can change a lot from run to run. So we want to make sure that we're testing end to end, but we only have like one recorded website and uh, that the developers can replay that website locally. And uh, we start with the network to make it really consistent. Next slide. <coughs> so uh, we also try to make it understandable when there's a regression in telemetry. So we generate the metrics from Chrome traces. Chrome tracing is like kind of our main performance debugging tool. And it's you know got tons of tiny details about exactly what is happening when. And then we pull the metrics out of the traces. Uh, so then we can just upload them all to cloud storage and people can Look at them locally when something regresses. Uh, we also make it possible to break down metrics. So you could have like a high level metric about um, how much memory was used and then like, well, how much GPU memory and how much memory in fonts and, and make it easier to understand like what part uh, changed. And then one thing that, that we've kind of like a little bit too recently realized is super important is just to have documentation on each benchmark. Like what is this benchmark? Why does it exist? Who owns it? Um, what's their bug component, things like that. Uh, next slide. So I just put a picture of a Chrome trace so you can kind of get an idea of like what, what the, the UI would be like when the benchmark regressed. Uh, this is like just a really simple uh, trace. It's showing a, an, a, a touch event going from the, the browser main thread to the render compositor thread to the render main thread and then a second event being generated from that but you can basically see like a lot about what's going on in the process and how long everything took, especially like uh, comparatively uh, from a trace. And then we can just kind of pull the links of those events and how many of them are, are there to, to build up metrics. So it's kind of like built in. You can run Chrome Live and then look at the metrics panel and see the same metrics that we calculate uh, on our uh, benchmarks. Next slide. 
So like, what are the actual benchmarks? We, uh, we first wrote telemetry, we thought, uh, well, everybody wants to write benchmarks. We'll just, you know, we'll write a, a benchmark framework and provide the infrastructure and then just let people contribute what they think is important. And uh, that didn't work out well. People did contribute lots and lots and lots of benchmarks. But then when those benchmarks regressed, it was like super unclear, like why exactly do we have this benchmark and what is it trying to test and what does it mean that it regressed and, and oh, it broke and who do I talk to? Uh, so we did like a really, really big refactoring where we looked at like which, which benchmarks kind of survived and which parts of like the user experience were we measuring or not measuring very well. And uh, we refactored them into like really uh, as much as we can, like really clear groups where each benchmark has like some pretty clear metrics that it's trying to measure and uh, as many test cases as they want to add, but the metrics part is really clear. So the system health benchmark is basically like uh, the, the top web pages and the key user facing metrics. Uh, rendering is like frame rates and smoothness and things like that. Uh, V8 has their own like uh, real world benchmarks where that, that graph uh, that I showed before came from. So most of our, our benchmarks are kind of in the user facing category where we have uh, actual web content that's recorded and replayed and then the metrics measured on it. Uh, but we do have some more like what we call micro benchmarks. Um, so all of the um, the press benchmarks like Sunspider and Octane and things like that, we, we have that like it's just a page and then it gives you a score at the end. Uh, we can still run those. We also have a, a whole directory of those types of pages inside of Blink uh that that are more like blink specific um and less kind of general uh those are really nice because we can uh you can pull them in any uh web browser and kind of see how they run and then we also have c plus plus micro benchmarks that you can just test a function so uh next slide uh so uh, realism is like a big part of the focus for the user facing benchmarks. Um, they're, they're like they're on real web pages and uh, anytime we see a, a real world test case that fail, we can just add the web page and record it. Next slide. Uh, the in page micro benchmarks are just really, really usable. Uh, when developers are talking about like actually debugging, this is what they want to do usually is like just pull up a simple page with a simple test case and repeat it and profile it and inspect it. <coughs> Next slide, sorry. And uh, the C++ yeah, the, the C++ ones where you're actually like, you know, micro benchmarking functions, th those are obviously like very reproducible and very easy to use. But we, we try to make sure that we're actually like testing like important hot code paths because uh, you can have those regress and then like it not be any kind of user facing regression. Next slide. So the next part in the stack. Uh, the next part in the stack is a performance dashboard. So basically uh, we run the tests on a continuous build and then after every run they upload the results to the perp dashboard. And it can automatically detect regressions in time series, and it can also kind of group them. It just has some basic grouping where it says like, uh, at these uh, revisions, uh, this benchmark regressed uh, on multiple platforms or multiple test cases. Uh, it integrates with our bug tracker, so you can like click a button to file a bug, and then it also integrates with the bisect tool, so it'll automatically bisect when you file a bug. Next slide. And uh, this is just a, a picture of like what a graph looks like. Uh, I think it's you know really common for performance tests to be quite noisy. And so uh, we have a, a sliding window step detection algorithm that that can look at a, a noisy graph and uh, try to find like a consistent regression. Next slide. So I linked the documentation in the slides if anybody's curious how it works. Uh, but basically, every time we add a new data point, uh, we take like we use that as a, um, the end of the window, and then the last regression is the start of the window, and we kind of like step different windows, and then within windows, we try to break it into seg each, break the window into segments and find like the biggest uh, step, uh, and then we have a bunch of filters that say if like that step was uh, a re regression. Uh, so they, they can say like, 
was there like for binary size like was it more than 200 kilobytes what, what, what was the absolute change uh, you can also do relative change was it more than five percent uh, multiple of standard deviation you know like like was with how much noise was it within and uh, we also have a filter for steppiness uh, was it like an actual step versus kind of it, uh, slow creep can be really hard to to understand with this type of uh, system. Next slide. Uh, and then we also have some features for understandability. So like I said, telemetry generates those traces uh, and it uploads them to cloud storage. And then for every data point on the perf dashboard, you can click and see the trace. You can also click and rerun the test. I see the same bot, but like not literally the same device, the same device type at least, but you can get additional tracing categories. So like more performance debugging data, uh, all the stuff I talked about before with like who owns this test and where's the documentation, it, it links that. And uh, it also like if you type your commit number in, it'll show you like uh, every uh, performance change around that commit. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is our bisection tool. It's called Pinpoint. Uh, I, there's other things called Pinpoint. Sorry, it's confusing. I linked the, the source code. Um, but it, uh, the, the perp dashboard automatically kicks off bisects on Pinpoint. And it can also uh, bisect. You might be thinking uh, when I talk about, oh, we're doing real web pages and they're recorded and we're simulating the network and then we're generating performance metrics from traces. Like, isn't that a bit flaky? And sometimes it is, absolutely. Uh, and so the, the tool can uh, also uh, bisect sources of test flakiness, which is pretty cool. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the bisection algorithm. I linked the explainer. Uh, it, it has a ton more de details. Uh, but basically, it has to run uh, multiple times uh, before and after. And so whenever it's comparing two revisions, it runs multiple times, and it tries to compare the distribution of samples to see if it can uh, rule out the null hypothesis. Uh, one thing that, that I see people try a lot there is using a t-test, uh, but we find that, that perf data is actually very rarely normally distributed. Uh, it's uh, usually like kind of a bump with a long tail. Uh, so Man Whitney, you works better for that, and, and we use that in, in another uh, hypothesis test to basically uh, figure out if the distributions are and we find that that works a lot better than like uh, other approaches, like just did the average shift or something like that. And we also uh, we uh, have a custom sharding algorithm. So basically, like I said before, we want to run the same test on the same device. But then that means that like when you bisect and you compare two revisions, like all the repeats you do, and you might like want to do multiple sets of repeats if you found that like the hypothesis test couldn't refute the null hypothesis in the first run. Uh, that would mean that it can only use like one device for all of that. But we found that if we um, we kick off the the first like if we were, do ten repeats, the first repeat on one device for both uh, before and after the commit, and then like the second repeat on a different device, and like we have the same distribution of devices, then uh, the map kind of works. So uh, next slide. Um, this is like an example of uh, an actual performance regression, and uh, it kind of goes over like why we're comparing the distribution of samples uh, on the left before the regression. It's kind of interesting. It wasn't really like, uh, so this is a memory regression. It wasn't always using more memory. Uh, the distribution changed. Uh, memory is really, really often bimodal, and we went from like uh, bimodal with a high and a low value to always having the high value. And we can tell at, at which change list that happened at. Uh, so the violin plots help a lot for like clarifying like why did it think it was this specific change. Uh, we used to show kind of like the average value or the median value, and that was uh, a little bit more confusing. Next slide. Uh, we also do a bit for understandability in Pinpoint. Uh, we link to traces again. We collect telemetry time it runs it, it produces a trace so uh, you can see the traces from all the runs so before and after again uh, you can again rerun with more tracing categories uh, it integrates with the bugs database so we file the bug on your performance regression and every time it tries to bisect that regression it updates the bug and says here's the the most recent run and, and what I found uh, 
you can also run an A-B test using the same system because we want to be able to do the exact same things like uh, compared to uh, two versions. So you can have an unsubmitted change and just send it to any uh, any benchmark or any bot and, and get the same types of results that you would uh, for the continuous build. Uh, and I think that's it. So, wow, almost exactly 30 minutes. Do people have questions? Thank you, Annie. That was, that was awesome. Um, oh, no problem. I, I have a list of questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, leave it open for anybody else to, to, to jump in first. Hey, Annie. Thanks. That was a great talk. Um, I have some que questions about metric selection and kind of um, how far back do you take those metrics? Do you do like one, two, five years? Also, kind of what kind of metrics do you have now that you wish you had two years ago? Like, just I would like some kind of expansion, discursion talk around this. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have an entire like speed metrics team and. Uh, there is a, a lot of work going on around this, and, and our metrics do change a lot over time. So we've been trying lately to really focus on, uh, lately for the last like four years, three years, on uh, high-level user-facing metrics. So for page load, uh, we want to get like a beginning, middle, and an end. So first content full paint, and then we're working on, um, so speed index is usually considered the middle. It's very hard to do for end users. Um, so we're looking on um, largest content full paint, uh, which uh, basically is kind of like the, the largest thing that painted to the screen like throughout the page load and when did that happen. And then uh, for lab testing, we use time to interactive. Uh, we're actually working on like a less noisy um, version of that, but basically tells you like, okay, the thing painted, right? But sometimes people optimize to get everything to paint on screen and then it, uh, it hydrates and it takes forever and there's no user input. So for this part is actually really hard uh, when, when you have, uh, you're trying to, to basically uh, detect that problem. It turns out that for end user, you really want to just say like, well, they tried to input and it was slow. What's the first input delay? Uh, so that's what we measure for, for end users. But if you're going to do that on a benchmark, uh, you could try to do it. Like if you, if you have like a, a single input point, people are going to accidentally optimize for like the input at three seconds or whatever you decided to do. Uh, so that's why we have the time to interactive metric for lab, which basically says like, uh, when was everything kind of calm on the CPU so that they could have uh, have made an input. So those are kind of like our page load metrics uh, for rendering. I think we're rethinking those right now, but we're trying to come up with ones that are about uh, smoothness, like like how, uh, you know, like, like constant was the frame rate and then like uh, throughput and uh, just, just you know, the, the total time to render. Uh, for memory, we have, uh, it's, it's like slightly different on every platform, but, but we, we actually spent uh, years going through all of Chrome and instrumenting every component so that we kind of break down the memory and uh, that we can do that like for end users and uh, on the lab benchmarks. For uh, power, we, we also spent years getting like a power monitoring device running on all platforms in the lab. And like at the end of all of that, the, uh, the conclusion that we came to was that it, it correlated almost 100% with CPU usage. So now we're just using monitoring CPU usage for power. Um, what did I cover? I think those are the main things that we're focused on. And then V8 has a lot of metrics that they're looking at, like more specifically about how each of the components of V8 breaks down and which ones take the most time. Uh, and, and they want to like understand that on real world content kind of on an updated basis. And then they're also very focused around memory and garbage collection. So those are the, the big things to look at. Oh, binary size on Android too. All right, uh, sorry, did that answer it? Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Thanks. Just a, a follow-on question to um, Benjamin's comment. You asked, or you mentioned earlier, which I think was very interesting, how quickly you know the web can evolve. With oh, if they make a change to React, you know, a big swath of websites will act differently. You said in there that you had some micro benchmarks that were focused on the user-facing thing. So I was just wondering, how did you keep up with 
How did how do you make sure that the micro benchmarks keep up with actually happens on the real world? Do you have a a way that you can go out and ask developers what they're you know? Do you still use async? Do you still use set timeout? Do you still use? Yeah, to to some uh, extent, it's actually quite ad hoc. Uh, but some things that we do is like we actually look at like well, what frameworks are people using? Like you can look at like which ones get downloaded most. Like I, th I think. I'm really I, I'm so into the Google tooling, but you can look at like NPM and stacks like that. Like people are using React more, they're using Vue more, and then uh, like the VA team goes out and so what are our uh, representative sites for those frameworks? So so we do a lot of like looking at what frameworks are people developers starting to use to get get that, and then then look at what are the the bigger sites using those frameworks and try to record versions of those. Um, we also kind of like look at uh, obviously like Alexa. We we try to use public sources uh, because it's just easier for everybody to understand like why are we testing these? Why do we call these the top ten sites? So they're the Alexa top ten. Does does that help? I think so. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh... Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Andrew. Actually, uh, can I, I just want to confirm, um, so in the test framework, um, there's no visual metrics like speed index being recorded. Is that right? I mean, you have maybe proxies, like largest contentful, but... Yeah, we're using, uh, like, first contentful, first meaningful is kind of deprecated in largest contentful. We actually found on Android that speed index has, like, a 10% overhead for the video recording. Uh, right. We haven't been able to find, like, a great way to, to get it... Um, like with, with low overhead and easy to, to measure. Like we try to also measure like um, in the test framework and in the field, the same things. So that like once something regresses in the field, we can say like, oh, did we catch that in the tests? Uh, that type of thing. Okay. Um, and then just another question, like when you're, um, like we have this issue where, you know, I think mean, Firefox similar to Chrome has a lot of preferences that we can configure, but we're, we're aiming for low noise, but then we're, we're fighting, uh, Realism, I guess. In, in your case, so in your scenarios, how what's what's giving preference? We end up really fighting, uh, re really pushing on the reproducibility aspect because we just find that that it's not actionable if we uh, if we turn on like all of the different permutations of everything. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, for for things that are. Uh, are less commonly used, we, we can get, sometimes we, we try like a, a dual approach, like we'll get data from the field as opposed to the lab for, for some things like, um, like fighting antivirus, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I think that the sampling profiler can give us some data on like how that's going. So we, uh, we end up using multiple approaches, but but we do try to kind of keep it as simple as possible in the lab and like only have a, a regression test that simulates a thing if we're absolutely sure that we can kind of like get it reproducible and that it's like a major problem. Okay. Have you um, had any experience or can share some background with us on whether you've had any regressions that sort of escaped the lab and you discovered them in the real world and realized that maybe one of your realism assumptions was too simplistic or had to be changed? I think we, we definitely have this problem right, where we have things that like we didn't catch it in the lab and then it happened in the real world and like all sorts of things happen in the real world like an OS update to a, a popular Samsung phone can like throw your metrics off or like so sometimes we we've changed like which devices we have in the lab. I think the the biggest one we do is is make sure that like the um the the, the right GPU path in the code it, like the most popular path uh, of of code for GPU rendering it is in the um that that is tough right because uh you have to make it was tough it, we've gotten it, it done but it, you have to make sure that you have real devices you have to make sure that like. Uh, their screens are displaying and things like that sometimes so that, that you don't like skip to the software path. So I think GPU is, is probably the biggest example that we've had there. Hey, Annie. Uh, I'm Rob. I have a question. Uh, thanks for uh, the talk. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just wondering, when it comes to page load specifically, um, how does your telemetry framework actually get the metrics out of Chrome. You mentioned 
uh, Chrome traces. So does are the metrics built into Chrome itself and that maybe you, you turn on a prep or something and then for every page load it automatically Chrome itself dumps that out? Or does your framework have to inject code into content uh, to grab those metrics? So generally we actually have the, like developers use tracing a lot. So they, they generally have the trace events already in the, um, in the code. And uh, they can either like add a trace event from start to end for how long was first content full paint, or they can calculate it from the traces. If they add it like like the entire metric in the code, then they can also just have it in uh, our histogram system, which sends it live. So that they they do it different ways, but basically um, the the to, the the well lit path is to uh, you know spit out trace events. Uh, the we use a DevTools protocol to read the traces, and then we have like a trace processor that computes the metrics Ooh. after the test is run. Interesting. Thank you. No problem. Hey, just once more about the Android stuff. You had said very early about um, waiting for the device to cool. And that's similar to um, some of these other um, kind of nebulous things about the device to settle. And every vendor seems to have a different idea about, like, is it two minutes? Is it four minutes? Do you push it back? Can you give any kind of clear guidance for us in terms of how we should be approaching this? Uh, we wait for the battery temperature to be below a certain level. And I can't remember what it is specifically. but. Uh, uh, so I'm American. I think it was 33C, but that could be a ridiculous temperature because I can't convert. So <laughs> apologies if I got it wrong. Thanks. And then actually I actually have another question too. Uh, sorry to get back to the metrics thing, which I know is like a whole other, a whole other team, but you talked a little bit about the beginning. You talked about the middle, and I'm aware of the WC3 perf uh, proposal for the largest contentful paint. But what about the very end? And these kind of like dynamic parts of websites, and like how do we know where the endpoint is on the measurements? Do you have? Can you any any thoughts there? Yeah. So our end measurement is the coupling of of FID and time to interactive. That that's how we we see it. Is like when when could the user actually interact with this site? So, so that that the lab measurement time to interactive basically says like. Okay, the, the site painted and then the CPU was settled for a certain amount of time and we're not like loading things off the network. So it's uh, uh, that it should be interactive now. That, that's how we kind of define the end. I have a, I have a question related to the WPL Go uh, uh, recordings that you're using. Um, how how frequently are, are these? Uh, so, um, how many how many sites? Uh, you mentioned the Alexa top ten. Is is that the full set? Do you have other sites? And um, how often are those refreshed? So we have thousands. Uh, we we basically have kind of different sets. Like uh, the GPU team has like some. Or, or like, like there's a whole set of like uh, these sites didn't you know we had a known regression on these sites on canvas so we have like a lot of like like hundreds of sites where we, we know that like that content might regress again and then we have um i think we try to do like we actually do it by bot time so the system health benchmark is like 90 minutes of content and we try to keep that as up to date as possible we'd like to record it once a year but it, it, it does get difficult to re-record everything does that make that sense? Andy, thank, thank you for the, the talk, by the way. Um, okay. Is that recording like largely a manual process, or do you feel like that's well yeah. automated, or what? Yeah, I mean, WPR has an automated process, but the problem is that, like, you know, it's trying to solve the halting problem. It, it does some things, like it, it, you know, like stubs out date and rant math out random and yeah. things like that, and it tries to record it, right? But you have to go in and record it and then watch the, you know, check if there are any errors during the recording, if there's any yeah. errors during the replay, watch the replay. Like it, it is quite manual. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't want to like, like knock on the tooling, like the tooling is automated, but you have to check it. It's, it's just not really possible to like, you know, 
uh, with all of the code that goes into the modern web yeah. to just be like, yeah, you can record any web page and replay it and it's just going to work. Yeah, that concurs with our experiences. I'm looking a lot at or a small amount by Google standards, but a lot by Mozilla standards of data that is showing me. Yeah, and when I say we have thousands, we, we these have collected over like uh, probably seven years or so. So it's not like we just, oh, I just recorded a thousand web pages in three months or something like that. It's hard. And uh, it was easier seven years ago. Uh, we also have a tool, um, this approach might be interesting. It's a tool called uh, Cluster Telemetry. And it just takes a list, like the list of Alexa top thousand. And it, it grabs that list of sites and it tries to record them all and replay them all. And it drops all the ones with errors. So you can use that approach to get like a large uh, data set of sites uh, if you don't care like specifically which sites. You know they're popular, but you don't know if it's, you know, uh, oh, we got 500 of the top 800 or whatever. So that, that's one thing that you can automate better. So I have some questions about trying to understand the scope of this effort. So uh, thanks for WPR, because uh, I'm we're not using it like at an institutional level, but I'm using it locally. And I had to do some stuff around it. Um, but it, so far, it's producing pretty reasonable results. Uh, the whole catapult like system is, is, is great. Do you know anybody else who's consuming Catapult other than Google? Like, what's the open source status of this thing? And like, how is that community healthy? Because this, like, I, I filed a ticket and crickets. Like, but that's not unusual. You file a ticket against some Mozilla <laughs> project, crickets, right? Like, we got crickets. Uh, everyone's crickets. But um, mm -hmm. like, uh, is, is there another major browser vendor that's consuming this? Is there a, a large scale website that you know of that's consuming this? Uh, I mean, all the other clients of like tracing and things I know of are, I think they're mostly, there's some that are external, but nothing like really worth mentioning. Like Go uses uh, the trace viewer. But I think one thing you should be aware of is that like there is a bunch of change happening in this space. Uh, if you try to use it, the tracing tool, you'll see like, yeah, it is pretty unmaintained and, and difficult to use. That's because there's a new project coming called Perfetto. It's at perfetto.dev. And it does like all the, like, so we're kind of going to break apart what's part of Catapult and what's not essentially. So we're going to kind of slowly reorient telemetry to be based on uh, Perfetto for tracing. Uh, and okay. uh, be because of that effort, it's, it's a little bit unsupported right now. Okay. And so I, I'm also curious, like, you know, Google Ad just operates at a really different scale than Mozilla. So can you can you put some numbers on like machine hours per commit? And can you put some numbers on like the number of people who are involved in this ecosystem in what capacity? Uh, yeah, so as far as machine hours, we don't have a, a per commit because uh, it's so expensive. It's about a any, any Anything to get some idea of the dollar yeah. uh, throughput so, so, cost. Yeah, so 30 hours per continuous build, and we do one uh, per hour, if that makes sense. Oh, that's actually way lower than I anticipated. I mean, huh, I can only test, like locally, I can only test like, huh, I can only test I don't know. It takes me like nine or ten hours to run through, I don't know, thirty-five sites, forty different times, type of thing. So I'm surprised that you can run, you can get meaningful numbers out of thirty hours of machine time. But okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I say thousands of sites, those are split. We do different ones in desktop and different ones in Android, and we have like platforms. Are you are you saying that there's a thirty-hour turnaround time, or are you saying that there's like thirty CPU hours? Like uh, thir like like uh, thirty CPU hours probably on desktop and then thirty CPU hours on Android. Like thirty CPU hours per platform. Okay. Huh. That's still low. Wow. That's that's sweet. Um, mm -hmm. Expensive but sweet. <laughs> and so and then can you give me some idea? Like I, I'm sorry. Maybe this was broken down. Like with your role. I'm sorry. I had I our lunch came late today. I had to grab it. Um, like how many people like so there are a number of teams and I think that Chrome has done a better job of distributing the work and that you have built really like the fundamental unit of like how to do things in this ecosystem is your trace viewer and Mozilla is kind of there like we've invested heavily in our profiler but we're not at the same place where it's a go to for collecting telemetry it's the first place you look for probes this is how you collect logging that you get it in the wild we're just not there yet we're moving in that direction but that's a many year architectural change. And so 
we had, but like, how many people are involved in like this test collection part? How many people are involved in your analysis tools? How many people are involved in your like framework maintenance, like working on catapult type of thing? Just ballpark. Yeah, so I mean, because this is like a many, many year effort, right? Like Trace Viewer started like eight, nine years ago. Uh, so, I mean, Trace Viewer could have anywhere from like, like zero to I think probably the most people like actively working on it at a time will probably be like two. Um, but again, it has like such a long history, right? Uh, that 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 kind of absorbs like the the work. And then um, the Perf dashboard was like uh, one to two. Uh, pinpoint or bisect is usually about one. Uh, telemetry and especially like the benchmarks are all, it's hard to really like um, really account for because the benchmarks are all written like in very, very tight collaboration with a specific team. If you, if you remember that slide of like all the different types of benchmarks, yeah. like so you kind of have like a very big flurry of activity with like two or three people from the team and then two or three people from the benchmarking side, like all ending up collaborating together on making like a giant set of rendering metrics and test cases, but it, it's like it's just amortized over time to a low number, but it's not really a low number. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. It's a little smaller group than I anticipated, actually, because you guys, there's a there's a number of, of things that have been built there. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot of things happening over time and things that are happening at once, right? Like maybe you have the rendering benchmark and six people working on that, and then you could have like. 10 people like throwing their lives into memory like, like memory was huge for a long time and that that was a huge huge effort um like probably 10 people can different 10 people but 10 people continuously over two years trying to get like all of the memory instrumentation and benchmarking yeah yeah mozilla has done exactly the same thing <laughs> it's building an os inside of an os it's really fun it's yeah but there, there's yeah i know there's so many partnerships though that it's a little bit difficult to do the accounting correctly because uh you, you just have kind of people Come, you know, it's not just that you have the memory experts, right? Like you have the memory experts in each, and then you have the experts in each platform, and it multiplies out in weird ways, and they they kind of come and go as each piece is needed. In a in a totally different direction. I'm sorry to monotonize the conversation. I'd like to come back to to something that Andrew talked about, which was around around visual metrics, um, and you you folks had done some work. Um, maybe you could you could save us from from. Uh, lopping our legs off at the knees here. Um, we also have witnessed pretty significant overhead with visual visual metrics. One thing that we're doing is we just instrumented our own compositor internally to capture those met capture video for us in ways that we feel are low latency. They have high memory bandwidth but low latency. Does does the Chrome Chromium team did you guys roll down that path? Like a lot of the visual metric stuff is actually coming out of the Chrome and Google engineers, if I understand correctly, has that is has that like lost favor, or is it seen as not scalable? I mean, can you? Yes, can so you we say implemented speed. At, at, yeah, we implemented speed index like several years ago, like like seven years ago, entirely inside Chrome, and then like you know the way that we did rendering changed a little bit, and it all broke and fell apart. And okay. So we've had to think. I think we've had two separate efforts that, that both ended that way, and that's why we tried to go down a simpler path of, of first contentful paint, largest contentful paint, uh, things like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, that we, we weren't able to to get speed index or things like that. Like to we have a, have to refactor things, and then it, it breaks. Is is kind of the big problem that that we hit, huh. as far as I know. Okay. And reading between the lines. It breaks, and clearly, it's not providing enough value to be worth rehabilitating. Or somebody thought that it was once, but then, like, maybe it got yeah, hard for technical reasons, like GPU reasons can get in the way. Yeah, There's a bunch of stuff that can reasons, happen here, right? Uh, maintenance reasons are hard, and then also um, web content changes. Like, I, I'm not the person that analyzes this, and I could be remembering wrong, but my memory is like the last time we did like a large scale analysis of lots of web pages, all those stupid pop ups that come up really screwed with speed index and that's a big part of the reason why we did largest contentful paint we have some logic in there to to deal with it but i, okay. I could be just explaining that a little bit well we witnessed the same problem and we don't really like we're just not far enough down that path to know how bad an idea or how good an idea this is we just we know that we we know that we got problems but we don't know what the solutions and the non-solutions are yet so thanks for the context i appreciate that
Yeah, no problem. And I would definitely reach out to like Tim Dresser on our side, Lee's uh, Chrome Speed Metrics. Uh, it's speed hyphen metrics hyphen dev at chromium.org if, if you want to talk to them about like metrics and things like that. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk more. Thank you. I think I'll have to follow up to get that email address, but that's fine. That's on me, not you. Okay. Uh, any uh, just a quick question. Um, is it true then that you're not doing any testing against live sites and everything is with web page replay? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not no continuous testing against live sites. We do do some like large scale one off like uh, how does this change affect live sites? Uh, okay. But usually it's with web page replay, and then all the continuous build is with web page replay. Okay, great. I did, wasn't aware that Web3 Play had a way to fix the network latency, so that, uh, and that's true, right? Yeah. Oh, that's good. That tidbit alone is, is great for me to know, so thank you. No problem. Uh, so I was curious about the, the, the target users for the, the, the Perth dashboard. Um, is this the, the engineers working on Chrome? that would be expected to use this, or do you have a dedicated team that are responding to, to the alerts and the regressions that are reported from the dashboard? Yeah, so there's, there's two groups. Well, we have a perf sheriffing rotation that basically looks at all the lists of, uh, of um, alerts, make sure they're like sane and files of bugs. Uh, but then like the, the main use case is like you get a bug assigned, you said your commit regress performance by this much, click this link, and then you see the dashboard and the pinpoint regressions uh, from there. Uh, and how many, uh, how, how large is the dedicated performance sheriffing team? I think it's about 30 people and basically everybody takes two days, uh, so that, uh, two business days. So then you're on the hook for maybe once a quarter. Okay. What about outreach to sites that actually do stupid things and break stuff. Like you had talked a little bit about the Facebook like changes, but do, do you have a activist outreach where you like try to notify them or explain the performance implications? Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, the Facebook like button was a theoretical issue, not like right. I mean, yeah. in general. Um, but uh, we, we have developer relations teams. So usually like if we happen to discover something like, like when we were doing um, first input delay testing, we actually discovered that Wikipedia had a, a regression in their menus. Uh, and so uh, we we usually reach out to our developer uh, advocates, developer relations. So maybe this has come up already, actually. But uh, any chance that uh, that the uh, recordings that you've taken for your corpus are public, or would you care to make them public? Uh, yeah. So we would love to make them public. The problem is that they are copyrighted. So we own the copyright to like cnn.com so we can sure. use a recording internally okay. and then we there's can't make it public. Use. yeah there's a fair use issue here uh is does that feel does that feel tractable though like internally to share those with mozilla so there is a process that you can go through you can email telemetry at chromium.org uh, to ask for partner access uh and we have a process that i i don't know i think i think maybe uh okay. I, I don't know the full legal blah 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 but but we can run through the the access and uh yeah. it's entirely try. possible that people in this room already know a lot about this but i figure you never get what you don't ask for right so yeah so maybe, telemetry maybe at save us nine hours <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we it, it like you can tell our framework is so complicated that like sharing the tests directly might be too complicated. But like the test cases, like that would be really cool to to see everybody using similar test cases. Uh, so so if we can get the approval to do that, that'd be super exciting. Is that something that we've ever explored, Dave? I feel like you might be the person who has the most context there. So uh, not not that I'm aware of. No, it does sound does sound pretty exciting though. Um, I'm curious, do, uh, do you do any um, comparisons with other browsers? I think you mentioned that with, this, with some of the in-page uh, benchmarks. Um, is that something you do for um, others? There's mostly things that we do on a one-off basis. We don't have anything on a continuous build that compares with other browsers. But like every once in a while, like we'll, we'll run like a web page test run that says, like, you know, like what are these metrics on the 
the top thousand sites on different browsers and like it's super interesting to find outliers like we found one um it was called oilevent.com and they've changed it since but it was really fast in firefox and very slow in chrome and it it was this huge table of oil conferences <laughs> and uh it, but it wasn't a table it was all using floats like it was it was like using floats for tabular data um but the the bizarre layout was really poorly handled by chrome so that was like something that we found that way so Mozilla's DevRel has to reach out to people and be like, what you should do is you should have 10,000 floats on a page. <laughs> First, you got to rerun the test because we fixed that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I just realized that we are at time. Um, but um, so there were a couple of um, uh, email addresses uh, and other things shared there. So. Ali, I'll sync up with you to, to gather some details, and I'll make sure I send those out to everybody on the distribution list for, for, for this event. Um, so we'll, we'll, everyone should be able to get that. Also, this has been streamed and will be available uh, on YouTube and in uh, Mozilla, so you can also play back for, for that info. Um, so thank you uh, once again, Ali. That was uh, incredible. I got more out of it. Um, uh, I think uh, from the questions others did too. Um, so, and thank you everybody else for uh, for attending. Um, so, just to to, to wrap up, uh, as I mentioned, look out for uh, an event, an invitation to May's event. Uh, we'll have Brendan Alexander and John Jansen joining us from Microsoft to provide a, a brief history and overview of their web hint tool. Um, and also, uh, a reminder: if you have any suggestions for future guests, please do get in touch. Uh, but with that. Thank you once more, Annie, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks. Yeah, Cheers. thank you so much. It was very helpful. Take care.